In the May 21st, 1938 issue of the New Yorker, the architect recruited Louis Mumford to start the newly opened Fortress Museum in the view, part of its tax and organ, for the peace in the city. Tracing the clean, spacious sense which gave the cloisters a strong, unfurled appearance, Mumford considered the cloisters one of the most thoughtfully studied and ably executed monuments we have seen in a long time. Since then, generations of visitors to the cloisters have shared Mumford's admiration for the museum, including Colin Carter, who wrote in the New York Times last December how he remembered the cloisters as one of the most romantic places he had ever seen. Indeed, the seamless incorporation of medieval architectural and sculptural fragments, such as windows and doorways, into the fabric of the 20th century structure is nothing short of marvelous. Today, I will briefly trace the history of the cloisters, observe principal elements of its design, and survey a handful of Romanesque monuments which have contributed to the creation of its magical ancestors. The cloisters could not have been realized without a prodigious constellation of collective philanthropists, architects, and painters. The bulk of the collection was formed by the sculptor George Gray Barnard during his sojourns in France from the late 19th century to the end of the First World War. These fragments were once part of monumental architectural complexes, the subjects damages from the political and religious achievements of history especially of the French Revolution. In the case of the cloister of saint de Vesin, a Benedictine monastery not far from Montpellier in southern France, most of its columns and capitals have been removed following the Revolution and used as building material that can still be seen today throughout the day. Sometime in the 19th century, a group of over 140 saint de fragments landed in the garden of the local justice of peace. They were sold in 1907 by the last heir of the family and eventually found their way into the Barnard collection. When Barnard returned to New York in 1913, he housed his collection of Romanesque and Gothic artifacts, including fragments from four French cloisters in a structure in Washington Heights, which he logically called the Cloister Museum. In 1925, the Metropolitan Museum purchased its content with funds provided by John D. Rutherford, Jr. After rearranging the display, including the outside ground and adding to the collection sculptures given by Rockefeller, the cloisters reopened in May of 1926 as the branch of the Metropolitan Museum. The limitations of the site were soon made apparent when new apartments began to rise around it and the proposed new street fell into cut through it. In 1930, Rockefeller donated to the city of New York a nearby tract of land which came to be known as Fort Tryon Park, with the understanding that four acres occupying the hilltop be reserved for a future cloisters museum. The following year, the Boston based architect Charles Collins, who had just completed the Riverside Church, was contracted to work on the design of the new structure together with Joseph Brick curator and director designate at the future cloisters. From 1931 to 33, Collins and Brett exchanged a copious correspondence often daily about the design of the museum. Housed in the cloisters archives, this correspondence provides detailed documentation of the evolving design schemes. We learned that Collins and Brett quickly settled on a general monastic plan for the future museum the choice suggested by the predominantly ecclesiastical nature of the collection. In, 19, in a 1931 report, Brett eloquently justifies the use of the monastic plan, pointing out that the medieval church, with its sculpture, its decoration of painting and stained glass, its treasures of metalwork and illumination, was in itself a veritable museum. Since the exhibits to be installed in the cloisters are mainly ecclesiastical in origin, it would seem appropriate to base the plan of the museum, of the new museum, upon that of the medieval church, or more particularly, upon that of a monastic church and associated buildings. Breck also saw as an advantage the fact that no specific rules governed the design of medieval monasteries, and that various parts of any functioning monasteries were often added on or modified. 
resulting in the maligned obstructors of the learning dimensions and stumbles. This early vision seeking flexibility and adaptability served well the ever expanding collection. For between 1926 and 1933, the year the final design was approved, many purchases and gifts from different periods and regions of medieval Europe continued to augment the original collection, obliging the architect to incorporate an ever wider variety of objects into the museum's structure. Deciding on the monastic plan without copying any particular European monasteries was the easy part. The more daunting challenge was to determine how to incorporate the historical fragments into a 20th century structure. Let us look at a reconstructed cloister comprising fragments from St. Bien, the Benedictine Abbey founded in the 9th century. This reconstruction was largely the effort of Joseph Brecht, and following his untimely death in August of 1933, his successor, James Wilhelm. Although a cloister by definition is a portal open to the sky, very early on, it was decided that the fragments decorated with delicate carvings needed to be protected against the elements and therefore needed to be moved over. Indeed, the Sentient fragments include some of the most exquisite carvings in our collection, some inspired by plant forms, others based on familiar biblical narratives. Collins and Brett also sought to suggest somehow that the original was a double storage cloister. But the site of the French monastery had long ago become too damaged to offer any useful clues for the reconstruction. William decided to adapt the power of what he saw in another cloister that is central to the Amal in Provence, hoping to achieve two purposes. First, that the parapet wall would suggest a second story, and second, that it would allow a flat glass roof covering the center court to be raised making its presence less obvious from the surrounding vaulted walkways. The suggestion of the second story was especially meaningful since most of the fragments of the cloisters are believed to have come from the original cloister's second story, generally dated to the end of the 12th century, at a time when the monastery enjoyed great popularity as an important pilgrimage destination. The covered walks surrounding the reconstructed cloister in New York are most likely inspired by the cloister of Montmartre, which is also covered by stone walls with periodic transverse arches supported by carved columns. The challenge is posed by St. Bien, namely the reassemblage of a group of dispersed fragments, were resolved by seeking precedence in other historically and stylistically comparable monuments. The word precedent is found many times in the correspondence between architects and curators, used to indicate an architectural component, such as a vault, a gate, or even a course in the river wall, found in an existing historical monument, or in publications about medieval architecture, which was then used as basis on which a similar component could be designed for the new museum. We see, for example, in the entry storage for cloisters, the so-called Postal Gate, an unmistakable reference to a doorway at the Cistercian Monastery of Fontaine in southern France, a president whose round archway was modified into a subtle pointed arch to complement the Gothic character of the vestibule behind. Another example is found in this northeast corner of the museum with circular turrets, small windows, and multiple woodlands, which loosely followed the jagged silhouette of the small church of Montfontaine in southern France, a structure column found is especially attractive. The reconstruction of the cloister from the Benedictine monastery of Saint Michel de Pisa posed a different set of problems. Suffering the same fate as Saint Bien, elements of the 12th century crucial cloister were dispersed throughout the region, but enough remained in situ to provide a clear glimpse of its original dimensions. The limited number of fragments purchased by Barnard in the first decade of the, 20, of the 20th century allowed its reconstruction at own time of the original site. As early as March of 1931, during the nascent stage of the design process, it was decided that Kushar would serve as the focal point of the museum. Breck made arrangements to purchase more of the pink marble 
freshly extracted from old quarries in Yakutia in order to create a harmonious reconstruction and has become one of the most frequented locations of the museum. As we stroll down one of the corridors today, or peek through the chapter house from Wadabana Kunko, the serene, contemplative atmosphere is only disturbed by the fantastic animal stories on the presence of capital. These animated images remind us of the famous letter written by Bernard Ferro, who protested the presence of these ridiculous monsters with unclean apes and fierce lions. The whimsical and sometimes bold depictions found in these Krishna capitals continue to compel many of us to commit the same crime when not observed in the past century, but we rather read in the Bible than in the book. While making sure that the general layout of the cloisters focuses around the two cloisters just described, the tourism and architects also sought to strike a fine balance between the building's interior and exterior. In a broad sense, they wished to provide a fluid connotation between, between the indoors and the outdoors, including the relationship between the museum and Fort Pryor Park, so that the master of the exterior would harmonize with its rustic surroundings to create, in Rockefeller's words, a culminating point of interest in the architectural design of the park. Or, as Collins put it, the building was to give an impression that it had simply grown out of the rock on which it was built and to become part of it itself. In addition, Collins created intimate embrasures and window openings throughout the building carefully framing the picturesque views of the rustic Fort Tryon Park, the Hudson River flowing by, and the expansive houses of New Jersey. We experienced the same framing device also between the galleries, from the early Gothic chapel into the Gothic chapel through a beautiful 13th century limestone window, or from the Unicorn Campus we run through a 15th century window into the crucial cloister. 1934 brought more architectural fragments to the collection. In that year, George Wurmenbach, financier, collector, and president of the Metropolitan Museum from 1934 to 41, dismantled the music room from his garden in Paris. Lorimer and Collins visited the structure, itself a reconstruction of a small church from the countryside in their Paris, to handpick fragments they wanted for the cloisters, which Wurmenbach generously gave to the museum. One of the fragments was this doorway from an Augustinian priory in Rome, near clermont ferrand in central France. Having served as the entranceway to Blumenthal's Sire of the Music, today it greets those visitors entering the St. Leon Cloister. Among Blumenthal's many gifts were a set of limestone windows originating from a Dominican convent in France, an artist from a cloister in Puerto in Rome. The 12th century chapter house from Notre Dame in Ponto, a Cistercian monastery in western France, was, a, 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 was acquired as late as 1935 and promptly added to the design just as the final model was being completed. The inclusion of the chapter house adds another important dimension to our understanding of monastic life in the Middle Ages. Often situated in the east arcade of a cloister, the chapter house is never far from the monastic church, the vestibule, or the places where precious liturgical objects or manuscripts are kept. Together, these rooms form the religious nucleus of the monastery. The subdued sculptural program of the Pontel chapter house offers a striking contrast with the lively images found in many of the capitals of the Kushka cloister. Metal rings still dangling from the two central columns are vivid reminders of the post revolution history of this room when it was used as a barn for horses and pigs. A good portion of the general public believes, mistakenly, that the cloisters had been built originally as a monastery, or that it had been a monastery transplanted from Europe. Frustrating as it is for those of us trying to explain the history of the museum, these misconceptions are in fact the highest compliments for those involved in the design and construction. They created a complex of indoor and outdoor spaces, which not only housed some of the greatest objects from the Middle Ages, but also, magically, 
preserve its air of contemplation, its otherworldliness, and somehow its holy sound. 